Thank you very much. Uh, I've been a longtime fan of Foresight. Um, the, the, since the early days, uh, it's really wonderful to see the energy that Allison and team have brought into Foresight these last few years. And it's really my pleasure to, to share with you today something that I've been thinking about not just for months or years, but actually decades. And um, the technology hasn't been there in the past. If there had been, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, I probably would have started a company for it. But now we're getting close. And I want to share with you what this looks like. Um, and basically, to summarize, it's a solar punk future as opposed to a cypher punk future or something else. Very optimistic future um, that draws on today's technologies of blockchain, AI, and brain technologies. With that, let's get started. So. AI, superintelligence, is coming. We know this is, um, is happening, you know, there's a market demands driving it, et cetera. So this is a thing that's happening. Um, one question, a big question is, maybe the question for now is, how do we react? But an even better question, in my opinion, is what do we want, ultimately? Where do we want to head, right? So rather than being reactive, we are proactive. So where do we want to head as humanity? And I mean humanity in the broadest sense of the word, um, as you know, growing and chasing our dreams and so on. So as a baseline, uh, we definitely you know, don't want to die, right? So whether it's dying from asteroid strikes or nuclear holocaust or AGIs eating us all, um, we don't want that. But we can do better than that. Um, for starters, well, already like quite a lot, several steps, much more positive. What about exploring the cosmos, right? Star Trek style or beyond. So that is uh, already a much more optimistic vision of the future. And if we aim just for that, that'd be pretty cool, right? Much better than don't die. But we can even do better. Let's reshape the cosmos, right? K5, Kardashev scale, right? This to me, like why not get to this level where we take humanity, where we are going out there and harnessing the power of the sun directly and uh, reshaping the cosmos at, at the macro scales, at the scale of galaxies. Why not? There is a hitch to this, and I, this is a hint at what's to come in my talk. If you travel to, to the nearest star beyond our sun, Proxima Centauri, if you travel at light speed, it takes 4.3 years, but if you travel at Voyager speed, which is the, the, the man-made device that's gone the fastest in space so far, it will take 73,000 years, right? So it's many, many, many generations, right? We're talking, you know, 10 times longer than when the Greeks were around. So um, that's kind of a hitch. And Charlie Strauss, the sci-fi author, has a good quote to, uh, that sort of hints to this, which is, um, sending canned primates when it was never going to end well. Right, so maybe you know we have to go beyond primates. So this talk is going to be organized in three parts, um, the, uh, and um, they will thread together into a final synthesis. The first part I'm going to talk about Web3 evolving into sovereign agents, then AI to AI superintelligence, and humans to human superintelligence. Then I will thread them together. Let's talk about Web3 to sovereign agents. So just state of the art, all of you are, I'm sure, fully aware of this given the community, but we already have a wonderful decentralized store of value, digital gold, it's Bitcoin, right? Um, more than 10 years old already, already at a you know, multi hundreds of billions of dollars market cap. Really great, it's a wonderful step forward for humanity. Definitely a node in the foresight technology tree. We also have decentralized data storage. Right, um, the leading um, chain, uh, chains here are projects are, are, are Weave and Filecoin, and there are many more like Chia and so on. So um, that's all, also something that has become fairly established, not quite as far along as Bitcoin, but coming along quite nicely. Right, and if you think about the three elements of computing, we've got um, storage, compute, and bandwidth. So let's think about compute. We now have decentralized compute. We've um, had it for a while, and the first really great decentralized compute system was Ethereum. Um, came out in 2015, and, um, and that is you know, smart contracts, which are simply small scripts running on decentralized services, right? Um, and one really interesting thing about this, that if you're not deeply in blockchain land, you might not know this, every contract, every script running on Ethereum is sovereign, if, assuming no governance, which a lot of them are like that, right? So like the Uniswap exchange, they have a, a contract for each of the different um, pairs, right? Say um, ETH, USDT, et cetera, right? This doesn't have governance built in, in their V2, right? So um, it's just running and running and running, and you can't change it. It's sort of like an agent or a bot, but it can't be turned off. It's just there. It is a sovereign agent doing its thing. 
And what's pretty interesting, these smart contracts themselves, they can actually store tokens themselves. They can store ETH, other ERC-20 tokens, Ocean tokens, whatever, right? So these things can do compute, and they can maintain state, and they can store wealth in the form of tokens. This exists. It's existed at scale basically since 2015, and now especially at scale, right? So but the compute itself is not that powerful, right? It's pretty expensive to do compute on Ethereum. Now there's much more powerful L1s and L2s, the, the Solanas and Nears of the world and the L2s, and we'll get L3s soon in all of this. And there's also um, many, many efforts to do, go for emerging large-scale decentralized compute. Initially, iExec and Golem, but many more now. There's 10 or 20 decentralized compute projects out there uh, really going for large-scale compute, especially for application to AI, right? A training AI systems, which takes lots of compute. So this is something that's happening now already. And of course, once again, sovereign. We have decentralized data feeds. These are, you know, they call them oracles. Chainlink is the leading there. And these feeds are sovereign, once again. We have decentralized prediction feeds. You know, every five minutes, will ETH go up and down? Every, you know, every hour, what's, what's the chance of rain in the next hour, et cetera? This is work with myself at Ocean with something called Predictor that we just released in production a couple months ago. Once again, these contracts are sovereign, right? So recurring theme here that I want to emphasize, these are agents that are running around, living in, uh, on a blockchain, decentralized, and they are sovereign. You can't turn them off. And we have literal agents. So the OG projects um, in blockchain land for agents are Fetch AI and Singularity Net, both from um, people with deep histories in the world of AI. Um, Fetch with um, one of the leading, one of the co-founders of uh, DeepMind and Singularity Net with uh, Ben Gertzel, who um, coined the term AGI itself. So there's, these projects are working on decentralized AI agents. Once again, they are sovereign. Right? So these other contracts are, save, so are sovereign and agent-y, but these things uh, add many more capabilities to agent using you know, more agent-oriented architectures, et cetera. So that's what, um, what's happening in the world of Web3 and agents. A lot of, there's a lot of really interesting stuff far beyond the hype you hear in crypto and stuff. You know, what the nerds like me that are AI nerds too really care about, right? Let's talk about AI and AI superintelligence. So um, for years, I, you know, I've been working on AI professionally since the 90s. And um, you know, circa 2004, or circa 2006, we would have to convince people, hey, AIs can be creative. So some friends of mine at NASA did this thing. It looks like a bent paperclip. It's actually an antenna. And this antenna could, uh, is basically at par with the best um, antennas designed by humans. And it was actually um, simulated evolution inside a computer, right? And one of those friends, Jason, um, he actually started a company called X5 Systems that then um, evolved these antennas for use um, by um, you know, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab and so on. And um, you know, it's been doing very well. And many of these antennas have gone into space um, as the antennas for the rockets, right? So this has been happening. I come from the world of AI for chip design. Um, and if you think about it, inside your iPhone, you've got about 20 chips. Each of these chips has at least a billion transistors. Each of these chips is designed by a team of humans, maybe five to 20 people, maybe 15 max. And they designed that in three months. So how can 10 people design a chip with a billion or 10 billion transistors in three months? They don't do it one transistor at a time. They use the help of AI. And it goes back even to the early 80s with things like simulated annealing. And that's where you know, my company, my work uh, in the 2000s especially, was all about helping people um, get to scale, handle process variation, all that, using AI. And that's why we can have these chips with 1 billion, 10 billion, 20 billion transistors, because AI is under the hood of all of these CAD tools. It's a $6 billion, $7 billion industry just for tools for people designing chips. And uh, this is a def def definition of AI, can do a task at a level exceeding a human, right? It's far beyond what humans can do. So this isn't something that just emerged in the last year or two, right? This has been around for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, right? It's just you haven't heard about it because it's a niche industry, right? And by the way, AI has been a swear word until recently, right? We were through a decades long AI winter. The last AI hype cycle was in the 80s, right, with expert systems. And then it became a swear word. So my first two startups, I couldn't say the word AI. So we said, you know, when machine learning got sexy, we said that. Anyway, a whole other story. The point is, um, there's AIs that can do attack, uh, tasks at a level far exceeding a human. And the thing is, market forces have been driving AI compute up. So this is a plot, x-axis is time, going from about 1950 till about 2030, right? And uh, the y-axis is the number of flops. Um, and it's actually exponential. So you know, in the year 1950, we had about uh, 100 flops. And now uh, we're at the level of um, about 10x beyond what uh, human level is, right? So I have a level here, one human worth of compute is 20 petaflops. That's the definition by George Hotz that I really like. Just like the idea of um, one horsepower is roughly the work of one human, right? And that's a certain number of Newtons, if I recall. 
So one human worth, worth of effort for plop, flops is 20 petaflops. So how powerful is your computer? Is it 10 humans worth? 1,000? What? Right? And notice that the knee of the curve happened in this deep learning area. That's the light blue there. And we're past that. Now we're in the large scale area, right? By the way, circuits had a large scale era too. Then we went to a very large scale era. And then after that, they ran out of acronyms. So just stayed with very large scale for a long, long time. But it's, you know, we hit this knee of the curve and the exponential is even more aggressive now, right? So in the last few years, we've gone, you know, several orders of magnitude for compute going up. Why? Market forces, right? Um, if you can have these AIs, you can make a ton of money, right? And that's why there's so much money flowing into this. Um, so a good definition, a pragmatic definition of AGI is can do all tasks that only a human can previously do, rather than just one or two tasks, do all tasks, right? So this is like the NASA antenna, but not just for antennas, but everything, right? Um, it's actually very close to uh, a definition of the word wise, um, but can do all tasks that a human, yeah, can do all tasks that only a human could previously do, but we can go beyond that too. AI superintelligence, and this is, can do all tasks at a level far exceeding human. So it's useful to distinguish from AGI, which is par with human, to AGI, which is far exceeding human, right? Sorry, AGI to AI superintelligence. Um, all tasks at a level far exceeding human, right? And you might think, okay, maybe this is what it's like. So there's, you know, the y-axis is intelligence, right? You might think, okay, there's the outgroup, the chimps, they're not very smart, and then there's humans. And then superintelligence is like the Einsteins, or maybe slightly smarter than Einstein, right? That's what you might think. And, and by the way, uh, I'm going to extrapolate on that. But there's this idea, you know, on the internet, no one knows you're an AGI. There's already, I'm willing to bet, thousands of AGIs out there that we have no idea about that are just interacting with us, right? Go to Twitter and you'll see it all the time, right? Um, but going back, so this is actually what AI superintelligence is. It's way far to the right, right? Because superintelligence doesn't stop to add just 2x smarter than humans. Um, once you get to 2x, market forces will take it to 10x, then 100x, then 1,000x, right? So this is the thing we have to think about and be concerned about too, right? Be concerned about or be excited about, depending how we think about it as humanity. Not as humans, as humanity first. So um, AI superintelligence is going to get to 1,000x smarter than humans, and it won't stop there. It's going to keep going, 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 right? And market forces will take it there. Um, and of course, this is the concern, is that these um, superintelligences are going to be unfriendly to humans, right? Um, and uh, there's the question of, yeah, many, many questions related, but this is the concern. And I'm just going to briefly survey the approaches to, to solve it. So one, you know, one common idea is let's unplug it, right? Yeah, of course, this thing is smart, right? It's 1x or 100x smarter than a human. So by the way, it's going to be sovereign, right? Just like all these dumb smart contracts and increasingly smarter smart contracts are already sovereign. So these are going to be sovereign too. You can't unplug it, just like you can't unplug Bitcoin. You can unplug Ethereum. Um, so um, unplugging this AGI or superintelligence isn't going to work, right? So, and it'll be like, no, I can't allow you to do that, Dave. Um, another idea, right? Slow it down, then solve it. So, you know, this magical idea that if we buy ourselves 10 years, 20 years, somehow we'll magically have a new idea, right? Well, um, we've been, people have been worried about this since the 40s, right? The von Neumanns and the Turings, right? And um, I, I think it's wishful thinking to believe that in 10 years or 20 years, we can somehow have a radically new idea to, to solve the, the, the AI alignment problem or risk problem. Um, here's an even crazier idea, right? Um, I guess I should put an X across him now, whoever's left at OpenAI. But the idea is, let's get an AGI to solve it, right? Well, um, that is, okay, the AGI itself will be like, hey, this is great. I'm going to go faster, 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 right? So I'm not sure that will actually work in practice. Um, the effective accelerationists, the, the Beth Jesus of the world and the Mark Andreessen's of the world are saying, let everyone have at it, speed it up. And this is actually pretty pragmatic in many ways because it actually acknowledges that our, there are market forces. People, there's a lot of money to be made, right? So um, that's one force. And there's also, ultimately, if all of this gets shut down, it's still USA versus China, right? So um, rather than just have USA with its one or five teams going for it and China with its one or five teams, why not have it where it's basically democratized many more? So, so that's actually potentially um, less risky, um, but also it's scary in other ways. So it's, I, I like the techno optimism take, but can we do better yet? Um, another idea is Larry Page of Google and others have say, you know, let go, this is evolution, right? Uh, it's not like humans with our meat bag selves are at the, the last, the final stop in evolution. Evolution is a force that's just out there that doesn't stop, survival of the fittest, all of this, right? And I've spent a lot of time in the world of evolution myself, um, evolving computers uh, for, uh, you know, for designing analog circuits and more. 
Um, so there's a sixth idea, which is we need a competitive substrate, right? So acknowledging that um, out there right now, we have our meat bag selves, and these have a limit, 20 petaflops, right? Maybe 25 if you're really, you know, if you're Einstein or something. Um, but uh, there's a limit, right? And um, maybe we can biohack ourselves to get a, a 2x or a 10x. Um, but if given that the, the silicon is already way farther, um, can, we, can we do better than that? So ultimately, silicon might be our friend here, right? So I'm going to explore that soon. So overall, let's talk about humans going to human superintelligence. So I'm going to also briefly review many technologies that are there or emerging. So um, there is fast typing via non-invasive BCI, right? So um, Stephen Hawking, uh, he, uh, you know, brilliant physicist, even when he was like a teenager, right? Uh, he, he got Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, yet uh, you've seen all these photos of him in his wheelchair and stuff, but he kept writing books. You know how? This, right? He was using um, EEG scanners on his head that were measuring the electrical impulses to type, right? And he wrote many books over the years about this, right? So he had locked-in syndrome. He literally couldn't move, yet he could still type because it sensed him. And this has become pretty good. Out of uh, China, by about 2012, we could, um, this is an example from Singha University. They're typing at 40 words per minute just by thinking about it, right? And over the years, the AI has gotten better, better, better. So that's, uh, even 10 years ago, uh, we were at par with human typing, average human. Um, there's other companies out there that are aiming on different things. There's a startup called Neurable that is doing consumer BCI headphones for focus. So you put on these headphones and it's detecting the electrical signals around your ear and it allows you to focus because actually focus is one thing that EEG is quite good at detecting. And if it notices you're not focusing, then it'll go bing, bing, focus. And then you try to snap back into it. Um, there's a lot of work on helping deaf people um, uh, to understand what's being said. So uh, there's um, glasses that you can put on and they have subtitles. And when, um, if, you, if you're a deaf person, then it automatically listens to the, the speech, does speech recognition, and then types on the subtitles. And the technology to write subtitles on a, a glass, this is very easy. This is LED technology going back to the 70s, right? So it's very cheap and easy to do this. It's quite pragmatic. So we're gonna probably see a spate of startups um, doing that much more. Uh, we know as of, this is like Google Glass Plus Plus, right? Um, so as of about six weeks ago, uh, Meta with Ray-Ban shipped um, the Ray-Ban Meta smart glasses. And it's got a camera, like Google Glass, looking around. And it's recording everything you're seeing. Uh, and um, it's got a microphone as well. And uh, you can then uh, control it uh, with tapping and so on to send videos to your friends, send photos to your friends, and so on. So this is a thing that's out there. And I think 10 years ago, there was a huge pushback for Google Glass because privacy. And because it was a bit weird at the time, but now we've had 10 more years as consumers, we got used to the idea that it's much harder to do privacy, so we kind of have to give up. We have social media, all this, for another 10 years. So there was basically no pushback here, right? For better or for worse, but the thing is, this thing is out there. And Facebook actually kind of um, DDoS to everyone. They released six products at once, including the, uh, where the Meta Quest 3 that also came out about two weeks ago. And I see there's some, some of them in the other room there. And this is not just VR, like the earlier versions of the Quest, but AR, right? It's mixed reality. So um, it's uh, scanning your room, it's taking video, and then it's um, repainting that video with overlays, right? With 3D knowledge. And it's remarkably good, right? It tricks my brain. Um, and I'm, I'm, I've always been impressed by it. So uh, that's, that's a thing that's here already now, right? And it's, I think, about $300 for that device. Um, so th AR and VR have come a long ways um, in the multi-decade history. Um, a big thing is going to come out in early 2024. So Apple, they only release a device when it finally doesn't suck, right? They had a vision for tablets for decades, right? Um, and they only released them in, uh, in the mid-2000s when they finally didn't suck. Thing, th same thing with smartphones, et cetera. So they've been re um, researching augmented reality for 20 years. Finally, they have a way where it doesn't suck, right? And uh, from what I can tell, the thing they had to crack was how do you do input to this thing, right? When you're walking around, how do you input? The Meta Quest, you have to hold controllers, or they've got the gesture style approach too. And it's not bad, but it's not great, right? Um, so what they cracked was they used the eye tracking. They have super good eye tracking where you can basically type by eye tracking and all of this, right? Um, and so there's a quiet buzz with an Apple from what I gather. Many of you probably have better idea. Um, that when this thing comes out early next year, it's going to feel as magical as multi-touch phones, right? So we're, there's going to be the before Apple Vision Pro and the after Apple Vision Pro, and the difference is eye tracking as the input device. Eye tracking is the multi-touch for AR. Just watch. Um, now, interestingly, you can view eye tracking 
as a VCI device. Because when you move around your eyes, it doesn't actually feel like you're moving. It feels like you're just thinking, but you actually are moving. But it turns out it's much easier to track that, right? But interestingly, um, you can even look at the, the, Im the video images in HD and learn a lot more things about people too, to detect health signals and so on, right? So in the last few years, there's been an explosion of research for um, using video on eyes for, for medical. So I'll quote, a rapidly emerging area of research is the use of the eye as a window to the changes occurring in the brain, right? So eye tracking is a BCI device. Soon, we're going to see SMing, silent messaging. This is uh, from Werner Vinge's novel, Rainbow Zen 2006, great novel. It's the novel for AR, just like Snow Crash is the novel for VR, okay? So SMing is silent messaging. It's sending text or voice by thinking about it. At least it feels like thinking about it. It could be by eye tracking, or BCI, or sub-vocalization. And we'll see a demo later today um, by Shan, who's in the audience, um, giving a demo using sub-vocalization. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, and so you send it like this, and how do you receive it? It's just subtitles on your glasses. That's the easiest. It can also be an audio, where it's just speaking to you. Speech synthesis is you know, solved, basically. So it can be either of those, right? Um, and this is going to be go mainstream, right? Um, and there's a lot of other things, but this SMing is going to be a big thing. And uh, Rainbow Zen, it's remarkable because it doesn't even celebrate the technology. It's just part of the substrate of just being there. People just use it, right? Just like we use Facebook or something now. Um, but once we have the SMing, the pragmatic tele telepathy, um, then there's going to be perfect memory, right? You'll record via your glass cam, like the, the MetaQuest smart glasses, sorry, the Meta smart glasses. You, so you record via cam and store, but then you'll retri retrieve with eye tracking and BCI. So you don't have to retrieve by moving your fingers around or anything. You'll just be moving your eyes around or thinking with EEG, and then you'll retrieve, and then you'll share that with your friends or with yourself, right? So you'll, you can, you know, remember what you had for breakfast. You'll just see the video from that. You'll ask that. And you can, you know, ask also. There will be a LM style thing to retrieve information, and I'll get to that maybe. Oh, no, it's a bit later. But overall, it's the idea of perfect memory. You never forget if you don't want, right? Um, and so this is baseline technology that's here now, so it just needs the commercialization. But this is the thing, market forces are going to drive BCI performance, just like market forces have been driving compute and AI performance. Once there's companies doing SMing and doing perfect memory and doing a few of the other killer apps with today's technology, then there's going to be money just pouring into this, and it's going to have iterations, iterations. Just like you know, we went from the iPhone 1 to the iPhone 15, and there's been tons of innovation around that since, and a whole ecosystem around it. And same thing with AI, it's going to happen with BCI. And for BCI, it's going to be on a few dimensions, um, especially bandwidth though. How quickly, uh, what, what level, how many bits per second can you send between yourself and the, the, the computer? Um, so then we're going to have basically uh, um, another thing that's going to happen is knowledge boosters. So you're going to have this co-brain um, that you chat to with uh, BCI, and under the hood, it's uh, simply an LLM, right? So you have this internal dialogue, Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder, that you're talking to um, to chat, and you're going to just ask questions, right? Maybe you're in a conversation with a friend. They're like, hmm, I wonder what the capital of Portugal is, right? And Jiminy Cricket will answer to you in your ear, and you, you can just ask that to yourself quietly, right? So, um, but it's not just that, it can go further and further. So as the capabilities of LLMs expand via OpenAI and the rest, um, it will uh, push this too. So there is a very strong synthesis among the pro progress in AI and the progress here. Um, then, of course, sharing visual memories, right? So retrieving these recordings um, by using eyes and BCI, one minute, okay, um, and so on. There's the mind melt, and this is a long time sci-fi dream, conversation and pictures. You prompt the AI to create images, you send those to your friends, and then your friend sends images back in the same way. Um, of course, there's a concern, not your keys, not your thoughts, but um, because, and as super intelligent humans, we need to say sovereign. So of course, we use decentralized data and compute infrastructure. Um, so how is this going to happen, right? So people are going to push for higher and higher bandwidth. Um, and then at first, it's going to be non-invasive. But people are going to want more and more bandwidth. And this is where we will go to the invasive route, right? So consumers are going to want it because they want to do better than their status quo. And maybe they have health issues, too, where invasive can help a lot, right? If you have gone blind, right? All that. And as well, as I pointed out earlier, to fix AI risk, right? Um, and you know, either Western governments will allow it because there's risk, or there's going to be hungry, smaller nations that will do it first, such as in Honduras that allows medical testing much more openly than, than most. So soon there's going to be research for BCI via implanted chips. And I sorry, that's happening now, of course, the neural links of the world. But there's going to be a market pull for this soon, for not just fixing broken humans, but optimizing healthy humans. And now there's research also for BCI via optogenetics, right? It's way less invasive. You take a needle, 
um, you get an injection, sends a virus to, um, to your brain, and you're shooting out um, when you think you're firing photons as well. There's soon going to be a pull for this as well. And this is probably easier to adopt because you don't need surgery, you just take the needle, right? And by the way, you can read and write with this, which is pretty interesting. So optogenetics is fascinating. We're all natural born cyborgs. When you ride a bike, it's part of you. When you type on a keyboard, it's part of you. When you use a BCI, it's part of you. That's what it's gonna be like. So at first it's gonna be the bio stack is gonna be roughly par with silicon stack power, right? So the bio stack is your meat big brain. Silicon stack is the thing that's next to you, your coprocessor, right? But of course, market forces and Moore's law will take it higher and higher and higher and higher. Thousand X more bandwidth, especially once we go invasive with chips or optogenetics. A million X more storage, a million X more compute because that's even easier to scale than the bandwidth. Um, so that means that silicon stack is gonna be radically power than the bio stack power. In other words, um, this compute coprocessor is going to be a thousand x more powerful than our meat bag brain. Um, but remember, it's all still you. This is an evolution from the iPhone 1 to the iPhone 15, right? Beca we are all natural born cyborgs. So it's going to be there, but it's going to feel like you. There's no magic leap in between. And so the market and a to summarize, the market and AI risk will push performance to human superintelligence. This is the thing. Um, and you know, as this happens, um, we're going to go, you know, 10x, 100x, 1,000x more, and then 10,000x and so on from iPhone 1, iPhone 15, iPhone 30, whatever it is. And let's say you're going along and you're 90 years old and you're meat bag, you're dying, you're on your deathbed, you're dying, right? Um, and and th at the same time, there's this emergent patterns of intelligence, consciousness, whatever, that is because it's a 10,000x more compute in this coprocessor, right? So in your deathbed and it's like your meat bag brain is about to die, what do you do? You clip it like a fingernail. You clip it like a fingernail. By the way, it'll all be unchained too. And soon there's going to be many general intelligences. Some of them of pure AI origin, some of them of human origin, and some a mix. And a good label for this all is sovereign general intelligences, SGIs. SGIs are going to inhabit the datum plane, a common ground for man, machine, and AI. This is a Hyperion thing. So to summarize, uh, for the solar punk future, um, AI superintelligence com is coming, and it's going to be sovereign. So my proposal for the solar punk future is bring BCI to the masses with silent messages and perfect memory. The market forces and AI risk are going to drive us to a competitive substrate. So as sovereign general intelligences, we can reshape the cosmos together. That's all, thanks.